Our moderator for today is Eric Kohanic, and it is now my pleasure to welcome the director, producers, and cast for the film Life of Crime. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to the closing day press conference of the Toronto International Film Festival. My name is Eric Kohanek. I'm the moderator for today's panel on life of crime. Uh, and with us today, we've got a full panel. We're missing one who will be here shortly. Uh, sitting next to me, we have uh, Ellen Goldsmith Vane, one of the uh, film's producers. Next to Ellen, we have Lee Stolman, another one of the film's producers. Uh, next to Lee, we have Daniel Schechter, who's the director of the film and also the man who wrote the screenplay of the movie. Uh, Tim Robbins is on his way. We'll be here shortly. Next, we have Jennifer Aniston, who takes on the central role of uh, Mickey Dawson, uh, the woman who becomes abducted and um, is the key player in the whole crime caper. Next to Jennifer, we have Will Forte. Oh, Tim Robbins. Here we go. Hi. <laughs> Tim Robbins, who takes on the role of Frank Dawson, Mickey's abusive husband. Next to Jennifer, on the other side, we have Will Forte, who plays the uh, part of Morgan, uh, Mickey's Marshall. friend, and or uh, Marshall. Uh, pardon me, Marshall Morgan's uh, Marshall, who is Mickey's secret admirer and close friend. Next to Will, we have Mark Boone Jr., who takes on the role of Frank. And at the end of the panel, last but not least, we have Liz Destro and Jordan Kessler, two more of the film's producers. I'm going to start this off by throwing it over to you, Daniel. Uh, you're quoted in the Toronto Star this morning as saying you really, really wanted to get your film into the Toronto Film Festival. you want to talk a bit about the quest to do that and, and what it means to be at this festival? Yeah, I do. Um, all through production, that's all I kept uh, complaining about to my producers, that I want to make sure that we can do post fast enough that we would be able to submit something legitimate enough to come to, to TIFF. I'd never been here before, because I get really jealous when I go to film festivals and I'm not part of them. So I wanted to make something that I thought could belong at this festival, which I see just see having just really strong American films with this slight like, independent quality with just an amazing all-star cast. So my highest hope was to be a TIFF film for this movie. Um, if you have any questions, stick up your hand. We have microphone runners who will uh, bring you a mic. You can ask questions. Uh, in the meantime, I'll maybe throw it over to the, uh, one of the producers, whoever wants to chime in. You guys were able to cut a deal while you were at uh, TIFF this year. Do you want to talk a bit about that and, and again about... Um, I'd say we're close to cutting a deal. We're almost there. Oh, you're almost there. We're almost there. Oh, Very, right on the end, end zone, right, right, ready to push it in. All right. Well, then we'll go to Very a, close. We'll go to a question down here. Yeah. More details to follow. Um, hello, I'm Swati Sharan, and I'm from Minority Review, which is a website from India. And uh, my question is directed to Jen, uh, Jennifer. And uh, Jennifer, you're actually really, really popular in India because of the Friends serials. You have a big fan following there. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my, and I guess uh, you know, given that you have such an international following, uh, I'm also wondering whether you would be open to doing you know projects outside of your conventional projects that you do. Like, for example, would you be open to doing a Bollywood item number for us? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> I'd love, especially those dance numbers at the end. Be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, can you talk a bit about uh, playing Mickey? It was a pretty intense role at times and yet comical at others. Can you talk yeah. about you know, going through the, the process of preparing for it? Because it's a little different from a lot of stuff you've done. Yeah, th uh, it wonderfully, beautifully different. And it was, um, I w worked with a, a wonderful uh, woman named uh, Nancy uh, for a couple weeks before, and it was just about really understanding the k sort of internal sort of abandonment that she was feeling in her marriage and and also the ab abandonment of her own self in this sort of passionless, loveless sort of 
life that she was living um, with no communication. And it was really about getting just very small and just almost numb. And um, it was quite lovely. And honestly, I had Dan, who's such a incredible, specific director and knows exactly I just felt so completely safe and everything that he would suggest or we would sort of collaborate on it was it just was so such a harmonious um, collaboration. Dan let's just step back a bit talk a bit about the story and and developing the screenplay and um, your admiration for Elmore Leonard and, uh, yeah, and I didn't work. have to do much developing of this screenplay. It was based on one of my favorite books of all time by my favorite writer of all time, Elmore Leonard. And I did a shameless transcription of an extremely good book. Um, I love it. And if, I think if someone read the book today, they would see, you know, 80% of what ended up on screen. And then it was just a matter of begging him to let me to do it. I didn't have any films under my belt that could put me at that level. And um, I sent it to a guy named Michael Siegel, who rep Elmore Leonard at the time, and he saw potential in it and potential in me. And uh, with these producers and Starstream, we managed to put it together, I think, just in a couple of years, once these guys signed on. And, and Elmore said afterwards, after you read the script, he said that other than Scott Frank and Quentin Tarantino, this was the best adaptation, so he gave Dan a free option, which is almost unheard of in the business, especially from an author of that stature. Hmm. Question down front, Bruce. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Bruce Kirkland from the uh, Toronto Sun, Sun Media. Question for Tim Robbins and for Jenna <laughs> Jennifer Aniston, sorry. Um, it's Tim's white hair is just uh, freaking me out because I'm going the same direction, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we all go gray, Bruce. Yes, we do, Tim. <laughs> yeah, uh, no. And it's a good thing. You look very <laughs> handsome today. In any Doesn't case, he? yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, shucks. Uh, so my real question, my real comment, is to inquire, um, how do you create a kind of an anti-love chemistry on a movie where you have to hate each other's guts? And do you look to the book? Do you look to uh, other movies? Do you look to uh, things in your own life that you might have uh, witnessed? Do you, uh, or do you just play <laughs> around? question. <laughs> or do you just play around and just go crazy and then give each other a big hug at the end of a scene where you're actually uh, expressing a lot of negative feelings. Would you like to take that one, Jennifer? <laughs> Do I have to? I'll, um, <laughs> I'll just say I, you try to, try to get in touch with your uh, inner miserable relationship. <laughs> <laughs> we've all had that. And we've all had that. Just a nice little well to dip into. <laughs> <laughs> big hugs. Yeah. I mean, you feel terrible for having been so terrible. There's always usually a check-in. You okay? Was that okay? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I was that way to you. I think it's okay. I don't blame you. I blame Dan. Yeah. <laughs> and Elmore. And Elmore. <laughs> <laughs> Question back there and then down front. Uh, hello. Juan Carlos Garcia from Mexico. Jen Jennifer, I know that you go very much uh, to Mexico. Can you tell me a little bit about what do you think of... Uh, the places that you've been in Mexico, and also you performing a prisoner of the kidnappers in the- Say that again? The, you're performing a prisoner of the, the kidnappers in the, in the film. Have you ever, ever felt like you are a prisoner of uh, all this hold of fame that, it, that there is around, yeah. uh, around you? Yeah, there's an element. I mean, it sounds a little dramatic, but um, there's times that you can, you can sort of feel a prisoner to certain things in in the in the business but um but we've chosen it so i don't you you learn to love it as and see them as just four beautiful walls as opposed to four prison walls um and i love mexico <laughs> Big fan. nothing better all right down front um, hi, I'm, it's uh, Neil Smith from the uh, BBC News website. Um, I was wondering whether uh, Elmore Leonard had a chance to uh, see any of the film before his uh, sad passing recently, and also, what are your memories of your working relationship with him, um, possibly everyone on the panel? Um, yeah, no, he didn't get a chance to see the film, which crushed me. I sadly, re he heard we got we're closing night of TIFF, and, I, and he wanted to watch it, and I said, just give me three more weeks. I want to do the music, the sound, the color, and uh, like a like a cruel joke, he, he, he had a, a stroke and passed away two weeks later and I never got to show him the film. He did see a sizzle reel that I tried to show some of the cast and crew and he got to see what Mickey looked like and Frank and Louis Nordell and Richard and I, I think he was pleased with that part, but he was skeptical of good adaptations of his books. So 
I think he really wanted it to happen, and he was also a little distant because he didn't want to get too emotionally attached and get his heart broken. But he loved films, and I think he really especially loved good adaptations of his books. And Dan, you did get to spend some time with him in pre-production. You want to talk about your trip to Detroit? Yeah, I think to my knowledge, I'm the only one here who was lucky enough to get to spend time with him. I got to go to Detroit and the suburbs around Detroit where he lived, and every location in the, uh, in the book and in the film was like written for an actual location in the suburbs, and I was able to drive around with his uh, research assistant and also just to pick Leonard's brain about how he writes, and I was referencing books he wrote 40 years ago that he didn't quite remember as well as I did, and uh, he seemed, uh, I think, touched by my clear fandom of his work, you know. We have a question in the back. Yeah, uh, Charles Thorpe, Us Magazine. Uh, questions for Tim, uh, Jennifer, and Will. Um, the three of you are all in such different, sorry, right here. Um, the three of you are all in such different parts of your careers, and what was it about this script and the project that you look for uh, in the projects that you get attached to, and what was it about this script that, you know, especially appealed to you? Well, for me, it was it was just such a different role that uh, was had come to me than that usually than usually does come to me. So I was thrilled and honored, and it was riveting and wonderfully written. And then I met Dan, and it was pretty much a no-brainer because he was just 100% clear on everything that he wanted and notes about the script and his thoughts on Mickey and this uh, wonderful kind of journey that all of them actually take, I think. It was just a new, new experience for me. I was just very excited to uh, be wanted. <laughs> uh, no, it was, uh, I read the script and, and loved the script and, and uh, uh, was so excited to be a part of a cast like this and, and Dan is so energetic and, and uh, and it, yeah, enthusiastic. It was it was uh, just a real exciting thing to to get to be a part of it. Tim, you have some thoughts. Um, I at this stage of my career, I'm more interested in, in quality stuff, and I don't want to. I'd rather play a part in a, a, a really nice project, good script, and director that uh, I really enjoyed meeting and uh, had a good time with and so it seems like a no-brainer to me too you know I just wish more films were being made like this yes Dan just to follow up on that can you talk a bit about the casting and assembling the cast who came first and how did you piece things together um, several of our cast members aren't here right now Yasin Bey aka Mos Def was the first person who signed on which he gets a lot of credit for because no one seems to want to be the first it's a scary and ballsy thing to do and then John Hawk signed on second uh, with the help of these guys who got me in the room with phenomenal actors and I think once we had those two we looked pretty quality so far it was like so far so good we, we really wanted to make a good adaptation of Leonard's work and I think I was just proud of that pairing and then I think Jen signed on after that, and we were off to the races, I just felt so proud of that trio of the film. So, but we had a lot of good casting gods on our side. Uh, we kissed a lot of frogs to get to our princes, and uh, somehow luck was on our side every way with this film, especially, I think, with, with casting and who we ended up with. All right, we have a question down front. Hi, Barbara Dudinska from Slovak News Agency. Congratulations on the movie. I have a question for Jennifer. The movie set in 70s. How much fun was it to dress up oh. for the role? And was there a favorite piece of clothing? Clothes, I, maybe? I, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there was a favorite piece. There was a couple favorite items. My, one really was my, my sunglasses. Oh, I really yeah. loved my glasses. Sure. Weren't those awesome. good? Yeah, those are really good. Those are, I tried to slip those into my <laughs> bag at the end of that shoot. That didn't work. And I loved my little berets. <laughs> I enjoyed the beret and the ascot. <coughs> Those were, it was pretty fantastic and that's decade for clothes, I thought. Not for the yep. men. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> a lot of polyester. A lot of polyester. <laughs> polyester. A lot of tennis shorts. Tennis, you tennis and shorts and overcoats. Shorty shorts. <laughs> yeah. To sort of follow up on that, then, Dan, talk about you know sure. the challenges of putting a period piece together like this and digging up stuff from the 70s. And maybe, Tim, you want to uh, chime in on this, uh, you know, I think you're a vinyl collector too. Is this kind of, you know, we we're hoping there'd be a treasure trove of records around there on the set? I looked, there weren't. <laughs> there was records in the, in the Bahamas. 
There were some records there, and also in Ordell's yeah, apartment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I never was in that apartment. No, it was great stuff. <laughs> no. I mean, it, it eats a lot of your budget to try to make a film feel legitimately, period. You can't just go shoot in downtown New York because everything is clearly contemporary. But the book the, and then the script was sort of very small on scale. It's sort of Hitchcockian. And we were able to keep it concentrated and make everything that we saw hopefully look pretty legitimately 70s, but not to brag, I wasn't even alive in the 70s, so for me it was oh, like, please. sorry, listen, I'm sorry, I wasn't, oh, I wasn't. Stop saying I that. I wasn't, so order, order. it was just very interesting order, order. to see oh, what things looked like back then. you just lost your whole audience. <laughs> just offended everybody. <laughs> <laughs> offended everybody. Oh my God. He used to say that every day, actually. <laughs> Pretty much. We have a question in the back I wasn't, there. I wasn't really <laughs> Andrea Bailey uh, from Canadian Press. I'm t I don't know if I can ask because I'm still reeling from that sev not born in the 70s comment. But my question for you, Daniel, is um, you said that Elmore Leonard found out that this got the closing spot at the film festival. Can you talk about that in a bit more detail? Who told him and did you have a conversation with him and what was his reaction? Um, there's a producer who's not here. His name is Michael Siegel. And from the very beginning, he was sort of my middleman. And he was very close to Leonard throughout his career and his life. And uh, I believe... Maybe yeah, you would know more than I would about this. My, Michael's represented Elmer for uh, probably gone on 25 years and literally has sat next to Elmer at the premiere of every screening of every movie he's had. Um, I met Leonard back in the early 90s when I was representing Quentin and we did Jackie Brown, um, which was based on Rum Punch. Um, so when we found out we got the slot, uh, Michael, who'd been involved intimately on the production, called Elmer and shared the news with him and his grandson and his son. And they were elated. I mean, they were thrilled for Dan and the opportunity he had and just excited for the cast and just to be a part of it. It's a shame he's not here. I, I, I would like to think I'm pretty positive it was at least a good indication that we didn't totally screw up this adaptation. So at least it was nice that he knew on some, to some extent that it was getting some love. And the film was, was I mean, we're all very well aware that it's a, it's a hugely prestigious honor to be the closing night film or be in TIFF at all. So I was, I was proud and touched that he had heard that. A question over here. Hi, Heather Seaman from Rogers TV. Daniel, I, I know that Elmore Leonard wasn't a fan of a lot of the film adaptations of his works. I'm wondering how nervous were you going into this project? Yeah, he's notorious about um, being brutal about the ones he doesn't like. And it's actually really funny to hear him crap on those films, but, but it's really nerve wracking. And he also had a lot of love for the ones that went really well. I think he really loved Get Shorty Out of Sight, Jackie Brown, um, and if I could have been in that top four, that was really all I was hoping to get out of this. I, I don't know, I, I would probably put an enormous amount of pressure on myself for anything I ever make, but um, it is strange when you're taking someone else's material, there's all that more um, pressure, I guess. But um, I, I think he knew I was taking that pretty seriously and I was shaking my boots a bit. Steady hand. <laughs> Boone, your character is one of the wackier and creepier uh, guys we've ever seen on. Thank you. Week. No, Boone. <laughs> oh, Boone. Boone. <laughs> how, how dare you look me right in the eyes while you're saying that when you're talking to Boone? Can you, can you talk a bit, bit about Frank and playing him? And Dan, too. Uh, Richard. Talk about uh, you please Richard. Richard uh, is, uh, is the character, I believe. Yeah. Richard. I wouldn't know. I've forgotten. <laughs> uh, Richard is, uh, you know, I, I, I've said this to, to these people, Dan and stuff. I looked at that when I saw the movie a couple of days ago. I really, truly didn't recognize myself at all, thankfully, I guess, because it, it is a, he's kind of a creepy guy, I guess. I've, I, you know, unfortunately, in this business, or fortunately, there's, there's a lot of people who do terrible things in movies, I guess in the world itself, it happens. So I end up doing that kind of often in the, in the business that I've been in. Um, but, um, you know, you kind of have to like, you, you, you know, when you're doing it, you kind of have to like yourself even when you're doing that, I guess. Um, or, you know, and, and Richard is a character who was having a lot of personal trouble before the, the, the Mickey shows up in his house. So um, she kind of just encourages him to delve into that troubled place that he's living. So I, I couldn't imagine being more proud of somebody that we cast in that part, which was extremely difficult for us Hardest role. to cast. Um, I think our biggest fear of doing Elmar Leonard wrong was sort of indulging in eccentricity so it became broad comedy, which we could have done with that guy. But 
Boone is such a smart and serious actor that it just felt so lived in and so real. And I never had to go to that place mentally. I didn't write the original material and I didn't have to act it. So I'm in all of it every time I watch it. Yeah, well, the material is really helpful all, all the way through. I think this cast, you know, really seemed to almost um, effortlessly go to this place. It, I, I don't know, I guess that's the material, but um, I, I sort of an absence of, um, um, like fake, um, fake. There's nothing that. That's the characters in this in in Elmore's work. Is there? There's not really bad guys and good guys. Everyone in has their problems in that in this in this cast. In the I mean in the as characters, and and I think that uh, he kind of lets them bubble up those those elements of humanity. Right. We have a question in the back, or you, yes. Hi, uh, Andrea Case, CTV News, uh, question for Jennifer Aniston. Obviously, as someone who is famous and we seem to think we know a lot about you, we probably know nothing about you. Um, what is it about the, the, the last list of characters that you've played that have drawn you to it? Because you look like you're having a lot of fun um, playing these interesting women in the last few films you've made, including this one. Yeah, I am. I mean, I feel like it's almost, i just so grateful to be um continue to be asked and now it feel i feel like i'm having a, a lot more fun playing characters that i can kind of disappear into a little bit more than 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 the norm so for me it's it just feels like a wonderful you know second act and um i'm just thrilled because there's you know we all have a lot in us it's just about get being given the opportunity and having somebody who's excited and enthusiastic and a, and a visionary like Dan, who who says this is exciting to me, and it's usually the the, the young ones, <laughs> born no, in the eighties. No <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Jennifer, to sort of follow up on that, you won't remember this, but the first time I talked to you and interviewed you, you were on a little TV show called The Edge. Oh my God! It's <laughs> going going way back before he was born. Um, way before I was born. Uh, it was too. a little. It was, it was no. It well, was, it was, he was 10, I think. Yeah. It was, uh, it was a Fox sketch comedy show. Um, yeah. Can you talk a bit about the evolution of your career since then, you know, coming as a relative newcomer on the scene, and now are you, are you looking now to do much more drama or more serious? You know, I don't look thing? to do drama, comedy, action. I really just am, am as Tim was saying, at this stage, uh, you know, I really just want to do really good material, work with really wonderful people who are committed to, to doing just that. Um, I'm not interested in egos, um, exhausting, you know, time wasters. <laughs> um, I have, have had a really wonderful experience in the, over the last 24 years, so I'm just grateful, you know, I just keep Getting, having, getting to, like I said, be asked back and having more and more fun. It's so weird that you said the edge. I, I completely, practically forgot about that. <laughs> Where were we? <laughs> it, it, it was a, a Fox party on the campus of some college uh, in LA, and, and it was just a. Huh. You know, oh. So there you go. Yeah. More information than you guys need to know. <laughs> there a question down were you here. There? Yeah. <laughs> um, this is another question for, for Jennifer. I was wondering if you could say a little something about the challenges that go into acting with your face covered, like, you know, to actually act you know, so with, 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 with your voice or maybe just with, with, with one eye, just the kind of, it's an unusual challenge not to have that, have not to have you, you, your, 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 your face to act with, you know. It's my moomin chants, it was very yeah. kind of, um, I, you know, it's, it was it's quite suffocating in, in there, to be honest, and it was, yeah. You just have nothing to, to play except your heart and the, f the, the terrifying situation that you're in. And that's all you need. It was pretty freeing, actually. And Will, uh, now I'll look you straight in the eye. And I apologize uh, for uh, earlier. I'm used to people <laughs> referring to me as creepy. So. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you talk about the shift in your career, too? You have left Saturday Night Live a couple of years ago. Obviously, you want to stretch out and do different things. You've done a lot of TV. You're now branching into film. Talk a bit about your, your goals that in that regard and, and what you've been looking. I, I, I didn't really 
have any goals to do anything other than just try to be involved in in things that seem like interesting projects that would have me be a part of them. And I, I didn't really expect uh, for there to be a lot of projects that would want me to be involved in them. And it's been just a, a really wonderful year, uh, totally unexpected, uh, uh, gotten to be a part of a lot of things that I'm really proud of and just so thankful for all these experiences. All right, we have a question back here. Hi, me again, Juan Carlos Garcia from Mexico. Um, we are at the, at the last day of the film festival. I'm not very sure if the actors know some of the films that were screened on the film festival and you have some favorites or some films that you want to see and you have heard that those are very good, something that you like. I want to see Nebraska. Yes. Go Will. <laughs> With Will Forte. <laughs> um, I, th I think I'm oh, the one. Oh, sorry. You're about to talk about here. I probably had the most luxurious free time here of anybody on this panel, so I, I've, seen, I've seen every film that I can get my, my, my eyes on, and I, I obviously love Gravity and 12 Years a Slave, and oh, yeah. it's daunting to be around films of this caliber and to think that I'm somehow part of this festival with these guys is, is pretty nutty, but it's just been, from what all accounts, a murderer's row of a lineup, and I think it's going to be an amazing year for just films in general, let alone this festival. Dan, can you talk a bit about uh, the role that music plays in this, uh, in this film and, and the soundtrack of the film. And also, um, well, I'll follow that up first. Talk about the music first. Being a child of the 80s, I wasn't as familiar with a lot of no. um, <laughs> uh, we, 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 we were We were a, a humble film in size. We shot in 26 days, and, and we didn't have you know, a lot of money. So the music was, we just didn't have a lot of money for it. And uh, my producers really helped me scrape together as much as we possibly could, but we had a great music supervisor who just kept sending me every you know, undiscovered gem or overlooked gem from the 70s. So I was just constantly listening to playlists. And then if there was a song that I heard on the radio that I wanted to try to get, you'd find out it was $45,000 or 60 or 100 and, and you'd want to cry. But we tried our best to get some really great, nostalgic, memorable songs in the film. And then some that I had never heard of before that I just now listen to constantly. I'm really, really proud of the soundtrack that we ended up with. And, and uh, can you talk a bit, too, about the visual look of the film? A lot of the camera angles focus on things like feet and on, you know, wheels and, and sort of little gems that you threw in there. Can you talk a bit about that? Um, You know, we're in that one tiny room that you're kidnapped in for a lot of the film, and I wanted to keep it as visually interesting as possible, considering where you have basically four locations in the film as our major locations. Uh, their house, the country club, uh, Richard's house, and... and uh, Frank's apartment, I guess. So I think I just wanted to be as visually exciting as possible. When I read the script, I saw the book, I saw pictures in my head. It seemed like it could be a Coen Brothers or Brian De Palma-like stylish suspense film that just had a little twinkle in its eye, a little bit of playfulness to keep it exciting. And uh, I didn't want to copy any of the other filmmakers who had adapted Leonard in the past and wanted to kind of put my own spin on it. I like when it looks like a director was having a good time shooting a film. Chemistry plays a big part in the, in the character's relationships. And Jennifer, maybe you can talk a bit about the chemistry between you and John Hawks in, in terms of the characters sort of finding um, a camaraderie at some point. Yeah. It was a, it's a beautiful relationship, I think, with what they sort of, I mean, of course, <clears throat> terrifying at, at first, but it's so it ultimately endearing and... Um, you know, she's even though she's she's kidnapped, um, and and it's, it seems like a very frightening situation. She's almost he gives her freedom from a, a very in, this life that is sort of she feels imprisoned by. So I think you know they kind of save each other in a way, and it's beautiful. And he's just so beautiful and lovely as this you know kidnapper, you know thief. Um, I think it's a beautiful relationship. And was it, did it take very long, or what did you do to sort of, you know, gel that chemistry sort of? It was just there. It, it was, honestly, it's just, you meet John, and he's so uh, present and very conscious and, 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 and concerned if you're okay, and, and works really, is very detailed, and, um, and we just kind of quietly went into it. There was not a lot of work to get us you know, to get any kind of chemistry going, it was pretty much just organic. And that was what was, and also, you know, everybody, 
I, I, all of us. I think the, the cast is so beautiful and extraordinary and all the performances. And I really just think that also comes from having a, a really proper leader. Um, and he was very clear about the tone, which is, a, and as we know, it's a very fine line that you can dip into the camp of, of the, these kind of, of Elmore. So anyway. We have a question down front. Can we get a mic to you? Um, again. Um, then you did mention that you didn't want to be holding to any other films, and seeing the fact that there are two characters from the film that had previously appeared in Jackie Brown, were you conscious particularly of not wanting to emulate that film, and also with your lead actors not wanting to seem in any way beholden to the two actors who previously played those roles? Um, Moe's Def and John Hawks made a very conscious decision not to want to look at Jackie Brown. So it was my script, the book, and our conversations that really informed those characters. But I'd be lying if I said when I picked up that book that wasn't a very exciting aspect to it. I'm a massive Jackie Brown fan, a massive Quentin Tarantino fan. And I also thought when I watched Jackie Brown, it closely matched the tone of his books when I experienced reading them. But uh, I think I'm relieved to see that the final product didn't look like I was emulating that film anyway. But there are a couple little winks to that film that uh, I wanted to pay some respect to, I guess, if you pay and attention. There's actually three characters from That's Jackie true. Brown, Isla right? Fisher's character is also um, Melanie, which uh, Bridget Fonda played in uh, Jackie Brown, but I think uh, I think that's where we went in different directions. I think I think I think uh, Tarantino made she was more of like a California beach bunny much type. Much different, and, um, much different. But it's interesting to see the way Yassine and John approached it, and having been with Quentin back then, to watch what De Niro and Sam did. And I saw Sam Jackson at Comic Con, and Sam knows about the movie, and he knew about Yassine. He said, "I'm really looking forward to seeing it." So to watch the different interpretations by these actors and what Dan was able to give them was a real gift for us. Okay, we've got time for a couple more questions. This uh, this question is for Mr. Robbins. You're in two of my favorite films, Mystic River and Shawshank Redemption. So I'm wondering, you're, you're known for some of your more serious roles, so talk to me about taking on a more comedic role, what that was like, any challenges there? Um, no, I love doing comedies. It's funny, I've done quite a few. Um, uh, and I, I, always, uh, I always am curious about that, because like, like when Shawshank came out, people were going, well, you always do comedies. Why are you doing <laughs> serious films? So <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, love, I love both. And, uh, but I, I like, <clears throat> I think that the thing about comedies is that, I don't necessarily think this is, uh, could be, should be labeled a comedy, but, but it has, it's, I think it's funny at times because it's very human and because of, uh, the director's approach to it and getting the tone right, I think was the, the key thing with this story is that how do you do it so that it's not um, trying to be funny or uh, stupid funny, but it's that the tone is, is more uh, respectful of the darkness in it and that the humor comes out of that. Mm -hmm. And that was my concern from the start with it. And when I talked to Dan, he seemed to understand that, and when he when I saw the finished product, he truly, really understood that. That's the uh, I think the key to the film is is how Dan captured the tone. It's funny to me that that was one of your concerns because one of my favorite memories of when we first met is that he did an orgasm for me in the middle of a restaurant to show me what it would be like in the film, and it was like being in when Harry met Sally, and everyone was looking at my table seeing Tim Robbins having an orgasm <laughs> because he was so concerned about the serious tone of the film. <laughs> And he nailed it. <laughs> Stepping back just a bit, Jordan, maybe you can uh, sort of take us through how this project came together in the first place. Um, sure. Well, uh, as Dan said, uh, they packaged a great cast together, Lee and Ellen, and then Liz, Liz and I came in really and, and financed the movie and, and put the money together, and then we all went together and uh, went to Connecticut and made a great movie together. So uh, it, was really, uh, it was really Liz that, that uh, sort of uh, we passed the baton to after the cast was in place and she put it all together and got us uh, up and running in time. We had a very small window to shoot the film because of all the incredible actors and their incredible lack of availability because uh, <laughs> of all the other projects they're doing. So we had a very small window and we took a shot at it and we, uh, we hit the target. So we were able to get here. And I, I told Dan we would never make Toronto. I said it was an absurd uh, goal. and. Uh, 
I guess I was wrong, so that's, that's good. Talk a bit about Connecticut standing in for Detroit uh, uh, in the film and, and the locations. It's not so much Detroit if you think about it, it's mostly the suburbs of Detroit. So when I went to go visit Elmore Leonard and I was shown around, it, it seemed very plausible I could have done it in Long Island where I grew up or even Los Angeles we considered shooting it in. And, but Connecticut I lived in and it seemed especially appropriate when I was there. We, we shot in Stamford, Connecticut and Greenwich, Connecticut. And it just seemed like a really good double and really smart place for us to shoot financially. And we got these amazing New York crews that could come up and work on the film. And I think that's just what gave us our production value. All right. If we have no more questions. Oh, we got one more down front here. I, this question is addressed to uh, Jen and Tim. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, you know, because both of you are so experienced with acting now, and uh, I, I'm wondering, like, how, like how, uh, how do you perceive this in terms of uh, your present-mindedness? Like, I mean, do you, like, uh, yeah, like how present-minded do you feel you have to be in your art? Very. Yeah. It's I mean, really I think a bad idea to approach it unconsciously. Because <laughs> <laughs> whenever that's happened, it's not paid off very well. <laughs> and there were some unconscious choices. <laughs> but hey, who hasn't had some of those? <laughs> yes, no. It's completely top conscious. All right, then. Life of Crime is a TIFF Gala presentation. It will have its premiere tonight at 6 o'clock in the Visa Screening Room at the Elgin Theatre and at 8 o'clock at Roy Thompson Hall. It is the closing night film at TIFF. Thank you all for being here. Thank you guys, Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you.